Yeah. So here's the deal, guys. In recent years, several socialist-leaning countries have demonstrated remarkable progress, not in terms of only GDP, uh, PPP, but also intelligence, innovation, IQ. Notably, China and Sweden are one of the primary standouts of socialist governments working. Okay. So let's start with the economic performance. Not socialist Sweden, damn. <laughs> well, well, look, bro. No, I know. Uh, they do have a lot of government intervention. Socialism well, here's the thing. Is I, I even proposed a spectrum so that you mm-hmm. go from the uh, democratic socialists all the way to the wildly authoritarian socialists mm-hmm. with, a, with, a, with, what is it, capitalism with socialist characteristics or whatever. Um the uh, China, first of all, has emerged as the global economic powerhouse, bar none, boasting the highest GDP based on PPP estimated at 31 trillion in 2023, surpassing the United States, which is only at 24. So, uh, got America got caught with their pants down. This significant economic growth is a testament to China's strategic economic policies and large scale industrialization. Now, Sweden. While not as large as China and not exactly the same culturally, also demonstrates strong economic performance with a GDP per capita based on PPP reflecting its efficient and innovative economy. Now, China accounts for about 20%, 28% of global manufacturing output compared to 17% for the United States. Beating them there. Uh, over the past decade, half uh, China has been the main driver of global economic growth, contributing 35% to global nominal GDP growth, while the United States is only a measly, piddly little 27. Now, China's per capita income has grown significantly, reaching approximately 13,000, which is about 17% of the U.S. per capita income. This is a substantial increase from less than 2% in 1990. So China is rocketing past the United States in all these metrics, okay? China has heavily invested into physical capital, which means infrastructure, real estate, bridges, roads, things like this, ports. This particular strategy is one of the major drivers of its GDP growth. This is accounting for about two-thirds of its GDP growth from 2009 to 2010. Now, China is shifting its economic model to rely on household consumption of the service sector rather than low-skill, low-wage manufacturing as technological advancements make it so we don't have to do so many factory jobs. So... China has outspent the United States on research and development spending, which now uh, is dwarfing it by comparison. China also leads the world in high-tech exports, which everybody knows. Shenzhen is the hardware capital of the world. Um, They make everything from electronics, telecommunications equipment, and machinery. Uh, And don't forget about their high-speed rail guy. You know, they built... 40,000 kilometers of freaking uh, train track going high speed while we're over here sleeping, waiting for Elon Musk's boring company to drill a hole in the side of the mountain. He hasn't done anything. It's like an amusement park ride. It's nothing more. Good night, Tofu. We love you. Uh, Intelligence and education. China's emphasis on education and intelligence is evident in its global rankings. Uh, So this is another metric. They are smarter than us. Now, as you can see with this graph up above, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, and China, these are the top IQs in the world, according to the data. Now, I don't see – I can't see real good, Mike. You see United States on there? (laughs) <laughs> I think I need glasses. I don't see United States on there with capitalist for-profit countries that it's charging people to be smart. I don't see them on there. All I see are the socialist countries that let people be smart for free. So weird. Isn't that weird? Um, Chinese students consistently outperform the American counterparts in international assessments such as PISA, the Program for International Student Assessment. Now, Sweden, also known for its progressive education system, also ranks pretty high in terms of intelligence and educational outcomes. Now, they're not on that list there, but you see Germany is, and we're right next door, and that's because we don't charge people to go to school here. The Swedish education model emphasizes critical thinking, creativity, and innovation, which are reflected in the country's high average IQ scores and strong performance in global education rankings. So they're beating us. Socialist countries are beating us in IQ, in GDP, 
Let's see what else. Um, so for me, this pattern uh, suggests that the capitalist approach to education, which obviously it prioritizes profit over accessibility and quality, it's less effective in fostering a widespread intellectual development. So you have idiocracy, you have the decay of, of civilization because people are running around stupid, don't know how to plug uh, electronics into the wall correctly. They can't tie their own shoes. They can't even make a cup of coffee to save their life. They rely on... Uh, everybody to do everything for them. We're idiots. Countries like China, Singapore, Finland, which feature prominently in the global education rankings, they have strong public education system with significant government investments. They're smarter than us, and they're doing it by taxing the people and giving them education. Strong country. You're patriotic. Beat your chest. You love the flag. Uh -huh. You want a strong country? Mm -hmm. Teach your people to be smart. Teach them skills that they can use to strengthen the country, to, to, to foster development, to breed innovation. Stop relying on Elon Musk to reinvent the fucking wheel for you. In contrast, the United States, with its increasing privatization of education and growing debt student debt crisis, uh, it faces challenges in providing equitable, high-quality education to all its citizens. The disparity highlights the potential shortcomings of applying market-driven principles to education, such as treating education as a public good rather than a commodity. And they think, well, maybe that'll yield better outcomes in terms of in terms of the overall national intelligence or uh, you know academic achievement. So another big point that can't be overstated, right? So is the innovation. Mike, everybody knows China's kicking ass, right? Innovation, they're reinventing the wheel over there. They actually have reinvented the wheel. Look at their EVs, look at the electronics. They're building the same things as us, just at a fraction of the price and, and better efficiency and not made to break like planned obsolescence. So here we go. Here's our China. United States has fell flat since 1996 spending on research and development. Now, China has consistently just grown year after year exponentially on their research and development spending. Now, talking about innovations, well, ask the people. Do they believe the U.S. is technologically an innovative country? Uh, the Chinese still believe that the Americans are competitive. Uh, but the Americans, uh, they don't know. Uh, Americans, if you ask them, do you believe that the U.S. is staying ahead of China on innovation? 41% uh, of Americans, uh, not too sure. But 81% of Chinese still think, yeah, mm, uh, maybe, yeah. Uh, well, and this is the problem here. This is only half the, the population. Isn't it sad that one half actually believes that they're staying ahead of China? One half <laughs> believes that they're staying. Well, we've got Facebook, so we're, we're doing good. I've they got a, I would, I would I've got an app. Like middle class people think that they believe that the U.S. doesn't have maybe as many companies or as much production, but they have higher tech industries, they have better technology, right? Because that's the assumption, is that all these other countries, even if oh, they may have more, yeah. it's just not as good, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, China is expected to spend up as twice as much as uh, the U.S. on late stage development research by 2018. This was in 2018. Look at how they just blasted right past the United States in research and development. So uh, I wanted to say the country of China is home to some of the world's largest tech companies, such as Huawei, Tencent, and leads in fields like artificial intelligence, 5G, and renewable energy. They're kicking our butts in all three of those, especially the 5G that's already rolled out there, and renewable energy. They have all the solar and wind that you could want. China's government, their policies have fostered an environment that is conducive to innovation, centrally planned government mm -hmm. who decides what's important and what's not instead of the market has substantial investments in research and development. Now, Sweden, on the other hand, with its strong welfare state and emphasis on social equity has also created fertile ground for innovation. Uh, the country is known for a high number of patents per capita. So Sweden is leading the world in patents. That means people that come up with novel devices and, and things and technology that it might be important. 
globally recognized companies like Ericsson and Spotify, also in Sweden. Uh, Sweden's innovation ecosystem is supported by a combination of government support, highly educated workforce, and culture that encourages entrepreneurship and creativity. So listen, I understand that you're saying capitalism has some merits. I'm not going to disagree. Obviously, if you marry the two together, but hey, can you at least not cut down all the fucking trees? And can you at least not make it so we get totally screwed on the things that we're buying and maybe we can actually have healthcare and have uh, basic necessities for everybody. I understand that China's got a dash of capitalism going. That's fine. You know, to be honest, they were already making great strides and improving their GDP long before Deng Xiaoping. 6% every year, year over year, Mao actually increased the GDP before capitalism was even uh, put into the thing. Well, I have a video we can watch in a minute related to this. Mike, Mike knows what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so let's uh, the climate crisis uh, also, come on, this is a, a, a China state-run capitalist model. It enables themselves to address climate change more effectively, right? So because it's centrally planned, they can say, oh, there's a problem. We can definitely switch rather than relying on market economics. We can just say, hey, Let's do this because it's the right thing to do because we're going to have to do it because we can't necessarily keep shitting in the well. So let's do your favorite part, Mike. This is the comparative analysis with the United States. While the United States has remained a global leader in some areas, it faces lots of challenges maintaining its competitive edge in intelligence, innovation, economic performance. The U.S. education system has been criticized for disparities in declining performance, declining IQs, declining grades. Additionally, the United States uh, innovation landscape, it's robust, but it's being challenged by rapid advancements seen by China. Um, China's economic approach, which in incorporates Marxist principles and state-directed capitalist framework, has demonstrated five things. Poverty alleviation, infrastructure development, technological advancements, economic stability, and long-term planning. Now, if you ask me, we should be stealing a little bit out of their playbook. But when it comes to, and this is my final point, when it comes to things like, here's the here's the climate change. Most Chinese people are on on point with climate change in China. They they don't they don't doubt it, right? China, you have a bunch of deniers. Look, thirty nine percent in America, seventy three percent in China. Um, is China tackling poverty? You bet your bottom. They are taking poverty and they are just whipping its ass. And here is uh, your favorite, Mike, U.S. and China life expectancy. Big one. Oh, it plummeted, plummeted. And China's has just surpassed the United States. So socialist countries are living longer than you, too. How's that feel? How's that feel? It feels good, doesn't it? Current thing is uh, awfully quiet in the chat lately. I wonder where they went. Uh, he wandered off before he could actually get a hold of any real facts. Uh, I'm going to go to another Twitch stream and I'm going to go see if Andrew takes on their shit. <laughs> Um, so the last point I'm going to make is about debt, right? Debt traps. Oh, China's debt trapping these countries. Everybody knows it. Oh, this just in. China's debt trapping everyone. Let me tell you something. They own less than 20% of all African debt. The rest is owed by the West. So when, when China has been accused of engaging in debt trap diplomacy, this narrative is wrong. In the Pacific region, a lowly institute report found that China is not, not engaged in deliberate debt trap diplomacy, though risks remain due to the scale of lending and institutional weaknesses in the recipient countries. So in Kenya, multilateral institutions like the IMF and World Bank hold the largest share of external debt at 45%, while the Chinese only account for 21%. The difference is China has provided significant debt relief with one expert noting that it's been the largest debt relief overall of all the G20 members. So China has uh, far and away forgiven more debt than any of the G20 countries. So don't fall for the hype. China has been criticized for its use of exit bans, often in civil disputes. However, the U.S. also restricts certain uh, travel in certain circumstances. Um, you know, U.S. prison system is... Uh, criticized for exploiting inmate labor, while we accuse China of 
forced labor in Xinjiang. Uh, the U.S. can revoke passports for various reasons, while China has also been criticized. Uh, you know, everything that we say they do, we do it, and we do it harder, and we do it worse, and we and we're just we're just jerks. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. 